Welcome to Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. I thank you so much for joining us here on the program as we bring you uh, choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. As we uh, come your way Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m., and then 9 a.m. on Wednesdays. That's our special edition of Tell Me Your Story. Uh, we uh, encourage you to um, uh, listen uh, via the internet as well. We stream live at those times at richarddugan.com. And uh, we're also podcasting on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and many other locations. Too numerous to mention. I've already mentioned me way too many as it is. We're also on YouTube, believe it or not. We have a, a, a channel there. Uh, Richard Dugan, tell me your story. Certainly hope that you'll uh, go there. Um, the numbers continue to grow, which I'm grateful for. I remember when I first started, it took forever to get that first subscriber. I'm now up after, what is it, almost three years? Yeah, almost three years. Uh, I'm up to 103 subscribers, but a lot more people are listening and watching. That's really what's important, to get this information out from our guests. And our guests are going to be providing us with some very helpful information that I uh, certainly hope that you will uh, you'll take to heart. It's because uh, it can, it might not not certain of it, but it might affect uh, it might affect you or someone you know or love. So we hope that you will stay with us. We also encourage you to spend time going within, listening to that still small voice during the decade of perfect vision where you sit quietly, calmly, you can call it meditation, you can call it whatever you want, uh, and just uh, listen to that and um, uh, follow the promptings, okay? We hope that you will do just that. And also, if you'd like to support the work that we're doing, we have a PayPal account. It's there for your security as well as ours. And when you do support us financially, it's going to ask you at PayPal, what email to whom you want to send this contribution to? What is it? And it is Richard at RichardDugan.com. That's Richard at RichardDugan.com. With all that said, we have a very interesting program. Um, I've I've certainly commented on my personal age uh, for, uh, well, beginning of this program. We started this program uh, back in uh, 2007. Uh, I was 47 at the time, and I'm now 62 and I, I am not aware that any of what we're about to talk about has any effect on me, but most everyone knows or has known someone with dementia. And most people fear that they too will develop memory problems as they age. And as much as many of us joke about it, dementia is a frightening idea. Uh, whether we call it Alzheimer's disease, uh, vascular dementia, um, any of the other names that uh, that we can come up with, which we will discuss as well on this program with our guests, uh, the uh, the progressive loss of our ability to remember, to think, to make decisions, and to communicate scares us more than almost any other aging condition, and it brings up for me. The question uh, that we'll put to our guests here in just a moment of where is this person? What are they going through? What are they experiencing? And quite honestly, it's the same question that I ask of people who have passed on. Uh, I asked this same question when my uh, my sister passed on uh, just about a year ago. Um, I wonder what she's going through. What's happening to her? Uh, you know, um, well, today we are going to be talking uh, with a couple of uh, doctors. That's right. Well, one's an MD, one's a PhD. <clears throat> and I'm hoping I get the pronunciation of their names correct. Uh, first of all, it's Emily and Mitchell uh, Klioski. Did I get that right? Thank you for joining us. Close. There's an oh. N in there. So it's Klionski. Klionski. I forgot the N. Oh, my okay. Lord. Kleonsky. We will make sure that uh, Emily and Mitchell Kleonsky, Emily is an MD and yes. Mitchell is a PhD. Uh, what is, and, and obviously because I've already sort of mentioned this, but Emily, what is, uh, what is your specific specialty in? I'm, um, I'm a hybrid. I'm both an internal medicine doctor and also a psychiatrist. But my specialty is actually treating patients with cognitive impairment, cognitive loss. So I 
I roll a lot of neurology into what I do. And Mitchell, how about you in your PhD? What was your thesis? <laughs> My thesis was on medical <laughs> satisfaction. So that was that was uh, back in 1977. That was many years ago. But it was really about the development of some scales to be able to measure how people think, how people perform, which is what has then led to moving into away from general clinical psychology into a very specialized field called clinical neuropsychology. So almost the entirety of what I do these days and for years have done is to work with people who have a variety of neurological conditions, ranging from things like concussions, to ADHD, to mild cognitive impairment, to any of the many dementias, to MS, seizure disorder, Parkinson's disease. If it affects the brain and behavior, that's what I do. Now, so I'm a say- certified clinical neuropsychologist, which is a mouthful. It is indeed. It is indeed. Um- And the thing is, is that we just never know. I mean, let's just say that uh, we go through our entire lives and we don't wind up having some physically traumatic event like falling and hitting one's head. Or maybe they play in sports like football or getting ahead by a baseball, even though they're wearing that hard helmet. That's still going to do some damage and so forth. Let's let's just say that that's not our, our, our wheelhouse. We just living an ordinary life. We stay upright most of the time and so forth. And yet there is still that chance that we might uh, begin to lose, uh, w- what is it, the faculty of, of memory or present moment, the now awareness? You know, that's a great question. It's also, it's one of those, it depends questions. So from a functional perspective, which is mostly where I live, how do people score on various tests of mental abilities, depending on the type of dementia? You can see that memory may be the most impaired function, which is very typical in things like Alzheimer's type of dementia. It may be, however, that they've got problems with their circulation to their brain. They've got a vascular kind of dementia, in which case it may be their problem solving or their ability to pay attention to more than one thing at a time that becomes the problem. It can arise as a language-based thing. You think of, you know, most recently, Bruce Willis in his aphasia and his development into a frontotemporal dementia. So there's a lot of different avenues all toward this general category that we call dementia. Mm -hmm. So it depends. Right. I understand. And actually what flashed in my mind was the question I asked my eldest sister a couple of months before her passing. I said, are you ready? And she said, yes and no. I said, Jeanette, come on. Are you serious? She says, well, uh, no, because I don't want to leave my husband and daughter uh, behind to deal with all of this. But she said, from a more metaphysical perspective, she says, yeah, I'm ready. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. And in a manner of speaking, this whole realm uh, is, would I be correct in summarizing this as almost, uh, it's an awful, awful form of, of death, not because necessarily the person dies, but because the loved ones are no longer recognized. So they might as well have died because this person doesn't even know who they are. And, uh, you know, and, and so then I, I wonder, like I said before, people in comas laying there um, who may, you know, they say, go ahead and talk to them because they, they hear you, they hear you. And, and we assume they do. And some of them come out of the coma and say, yeah, I heard you. I heard you. And you, I, I wonder what, what's going on inside, not so much physically or uh, biologically the brain, but, but that space where we think and where where we live a lot of our lives uh, and, you know, and what's happening. Um, Would you, would you say that it is sort of a, a a sort of a form of, uh, of death? That really is a metaphysical (laughs) question, Richard. I I would say that it's, it's a definitely a transformative state Mm -hmm. and it changes the way 
we perceive ourselves, the world around us, people around us, and the experience is not the same for everyone. Mm -hmm. It can be very different. People can actually die, as you know, of various types of dementia, but right up to the point of their death, some of those people may still remember who their grandchildren are or who their spouse is or where they live. Their dementia, their cognitive losses may involve other domains of, of their thinking, such as orientation or their ability to talk or their ability to do math or their ability to dress themselves. But what really happens internally, I think, as the experience of what a person's specific type of dementing process is, is unique to them, very much like my process of me experiencing who I am in the world today is very different than yours is. So we may have some similarities, but the reality is it's pretty unique and it would be very hard to describe. Um, I've listened to patients tell me what sometimes it feels like for them because it's important that I honor that and that I pay attention to their feelings and making sure that they don't get depressed through this process because that's a common complication. Um, so it can be very disturbing for some in that all of a sudden they feel like they aren't who they used to be anymore. On, on the other hand, there are folks who don't seem disturbed in the least, who can still enjoy absolutely everything in front of them to the best of their ability at that moment, and they're unconcerned. So it really depends on what part of the brain is affected, what stage of a disease process you're at, and also, I think, how you've lived up until that time, because how we compensate for things earlier in our life can often determine how we try and compensate for things later on. So if we were a bit more adaptive in overcoming bad things earlier on, then we may have a more skillful, peaceful, um, um, uh, constructive way of coping with a serious illness. Mitch, what do you think? Well, you know, I was going to say two things. One is that this was sort of illustrated to me just this morning with two patients I saw back to back before we did this interview. And one lady was rather young, had significant Alzheimer's disease, was horribly embarrassed and sad about it. And she cried during our interview and talked about the losses and how she was so concerned about others having to take care of her. The man I saw directly after her, a few years older, more severely impaired at this moment, told me there was absolutely nothing wrong with him and he didn't understand why he was there. He also told me that he was 83 and that he'd been married for 82 years. So you have to understand that the loss of that contact so part of all this, though, is, is sort of why we got into the business of trying to prevent dementia, which is really what our efforts are about. We've been treating demented people with dementia and experiencing it on a personal basis in terms of our own parents. But this is an attempt from our end to take what we do in the consulting room and to reach people who can't come and sit down, and we don't have the time at this point to see them, and say, Here's what you do at 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 even to avoid that place. Because we know now that one out of two of these cases are in fact preventable. So that's the optimistic message here. We don't have to wait for a cure. We can prevent this disease in a great number of the people if we alert them to what some of the issues are, help them to see where they are with it, and make some changes in how they live their lives. We are talking with Dr. Emily 
Kleonsky and Mitchell Kleonsky, Dr. Mitchell Kleonsky. They are uh, brain uh, preservation experts, if you will. There's a book called Dementia Preservation Using uh, Prevention, beg your pardon, uh, pre Dementia Prevention, Using Your Head to Save Your Brain, out by uh, John, John Hopkins. I've heard it said Johns Hopkins, but it's John Hopkins, it's University John. of Press. And it's uh, coming out uh, April of uh, 2023. And guess what, folks? You're listening to Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. And it is really a pleasure to have the two of you, uh, Doctors uh, uh, Emily and Mitchell Kleonsky, here on the program to talk about this. Uh, it, I, I have to say that my brain is flooded with questions right now. And, and I've, I, I'm, I'm trying to let the universe kind of put them in some some semblance of order, or at least get the first one out there. Um, uh, I guess the first one would be, uh, I, I listed a few of the names that we use, but one of the names, obviously, that we're kind of really focused on is dementia, which I find interesting because it's akin to the root of that word is associated with what we in the metaphysical community like to talk about, and that is dimensions, different dimensions in the universe on a spiritual level, physical, mental, emotional, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, and I don't know if you have the, if you have any information as to the etymology of the word dementia, but it sounds to me like that's where some some of these folks go is to another place. I, I've, I've heard it said that um, those with autism and there's another condition, too, that's similar and I can't remember what it is. Um, basically the reason why they have difficulty functioning with the rest of us is because th we're in the past and or the future. They're right here, right now. But folks who are suffering from these uh, aspects of dementia, they're not even here. They're somewhere else. Uh, would it be fair to say that they are experiencing another dimension? I would say no. Okay. With all due respect, because they're really different words. The dimension, D-I, is different than the dementia, D-E. Dementia uh -huh. is the decline in mental functions. Okay. So, no, they're, they're, they're still here. Yeah. They're still they're still the people we grew up loving. They're still the people that we need to honor and respect and care for, but they have lost abilities that they had gained while they were growing up as their brain matured. And now as they're experiencing a disease state, which is what dementia is about, they're losing capacity to do the things that they learn how to do. So you can sort of look at it as, as sort of progression in life in the reverse, okay. the more highly important things like critical thought and language begin to decline first, and then more basic kinds of processes, memory, everything begin to decline after that. And eventually toward the end, the person loses the ability to move and talk and care for themselves. So oh. real different. I'm sorry, but it really is a different thing. No, I understand. And Emily, I want to ask you, uh, if, if there's a way to prevent this, and obviously dementia prevention, the title of the book, I'm curious as to what has been found out in regards to who is, shall we say, predisposed as opposed to who is not. Is it in the DNA? Is it in the chromosomes? Is it in the environment, the lifestyle? Uh, what we take into our bodies, both uh, uh, liquids and solids, so forth, food and drink. Um, is it, and, and I even want to take it one step further. Is this something that's relatively new uh, to say the 21st or the 20th century? Because I, I know this was something that's been talked about uh, Alzheimer's uh, back, I think in the eighties or early nineties, because they even made the comment in regards to Ronald Reagan and his second term. That that's what he was going through, but they managed to hide it really well. So I'm just curious. First of all, how old is this condition? How long have we known about dementia? We've probably known about dementia 
at some level as far long ago as the Greeks and Romans, to tell you the truth. Okay. We knew that there could be changes in how someone perceived the world and how they acted and how they responded to it. And that's documented in really ancient writings. But let's do a fast forward. Mm -hmm. We've known that um, ever since Aloysius Alzheimer's, uh, Alois Alzheimer's rather, uh, took a look underneath the microscope of the brain cells of his patient and saw the, the clear signs of the cellular changes, plaques and tangles, and that was in the um, early 1900s. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we've been learning more and more about dementia and the different kinds of dementia as we've developed the scientific tools to figure out what it is, why the brain cells were acting this way, and what the net effect of it would be in our lives. You asked a really, really great, you hypothesized a really great question, though, which is, you know, where's this stuff coming from? Is this in our DNA? Is this in our genes, our chromosomes? Well, you know, there are some forms of dementia that are hereditary, but those are not the bulk of what most of us land up getting. Hmm. What most of us land up getting, as Mitch alluded to, is the one out of two that can be prevented. And how do we prevent it? We really try and take good care of our brains to start with. So when we're younger, try and avoid those traumatic brain injuries called concussions, whether they occur on a football field or whether they occur in a motor vehicle accident or whether they occur from falling off of a ladder off your roof and you're cleaning out your, the, the leaves out of your, your, uh, your, uh, you know, the, the edges of your uh, roofs there. Mm -hmm. um, or it may be the fact that, you know, you're probably still smoking, even though we've known for a long time, it's not good for your lungs. Well, there are certain things that we ingest that are not good for our brains either. But the bottom line is what Mitch and I have done is taken a look at all the scientific literature that's been published, all the research that's reliable and put together this whole entire list, which is also coming from the Lancet Commission in England. It's coming from the World Health Organization of the top 10 to 20 factors that if you address these things, you can be one of the two people in this country who don't get demented, who otherwise probably would have. So it's everything from fixing your metabolic disorders, controlling blood sugar levels, controlling your cholesterol, getting enough exercise to keep the weight down, um, really paying attention to how much alcohol you're drinking. You know, when you say you have a glass of wine, is it the, the little four ounce or is it the, the great big half bottle that they serve you in some restaurants? So Mitch, do you want to pick well, up from there? I think it's also important to talk about education. Mm -hmm. People who have more education have a lower risk of dementia. Now, for some people, it's already the die is cast by the time they get to middle age. Mm -hmm. But it is important to continue learning as we grow older. It's also a real question as to whether retirement is great for everyone. My personal feeling being past the retirement age by a few years is that it is not that if you enjoy what you're doing, if you're not doing things that are physically harmful to you and that are causing you increased stress, and there are some jobs like that, then it's probably better to keep working at least at some level than to stop working because it's mentally stimulating. Mm -hmm. We also know that social connection, uh, people who are married actually live longer and have less dementia. I'm not suggesting you go out and get married if you're not, but we know that if you're involved in a close relationship, it really helps. Yeah. One of the our book that we really look at is the importance of breathing while you're sleeping, a condition called sleep apnea, which oh, yeah. is probably undiagnosed, underdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a CPAP machine, I will tell you, but I don't use it anymore, even though only when I am, and this is, I don't know why this is, obviously it's something physiological in my case, 
Only when I am laying on my left side facing my wife am I snoring. If I roll over on my right side or on my back, I'm fine. It's weird. Uh, but uh, um, let's, let's jump in, Richard. I, I, I got to do this. I'm sorry, man. Yeah, we have doc- to. Doctor, what, is what, what is that? We have to do an intervention here, man. <laughs> you're not snoring, but you're still not breathing. I got you. I got on. It. Wear it all night. Your brain will thank you. One of the most important things that is is behind the reason why we did this book is Mitch and I are both, as I said, evidence-based doctors. And when I opened up my practice in 07, and I started to- uh, Wait, 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 wait. Opened up your practice when you were seven? In 2007. Oh, I beg your pardon. Okay. In 2007. <laughs> it looks like she might have opened it when she- Yeah, <laughs> no, no. I'll be 71 next month, Richard. You don't, <laughs> don't look at neither of you do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I'm the younger of the two. Let's let's keep things in, in proper perspective here. But um, when I when I opened up that practice, I knew that breathing was very very important. I spent the last couple of years of my last residency looking at all of the reversible factors that contribute to dementia. So I started to keep track of the oxygen levels of my patients when they would come in. I'd have them walk in the hallway, and then I started doing these overnight sleep studies. And actually, the first thing I do is just an overnight pulse oximetry. And that's where you you just record the oxygen level and the heart rate. And I was absolutely flabbergasted to find out. And we published and, and, and presented in the Alzheimer's Association in 2014 that 82% of my patients had a lack of oxygen in their brain when they were sleeping. The amazing thing is, when you go in and you fix that and you put somebody on CPAP and you keep them on their CPAP for at least four to six hours a night, you actually can stabilize their cognitive level and improve it over time. So that was a real eye opener. Yeah. In fact, a big chapter in our book is all about the effect of lack of oxygen in your brain. Because that affects so many other things, like the balance of your hormones that can control how how hungry you feel, and so how much weight we put on, how much energy we have during the day, or how much you really feel like exercising. If you're feeling tired because you need to take that nap in the afternoon because you didn't sleep right the night before, um, you're not going to be as prone to doing what you should be doing to to stay healthy. Mm. Well, I so will tell you, I will tell you, uh, that, you, we've got to start you back on your CPAP. Well, let me tell you something. One thing that I found uh, a few years ago, uh, a couple of things here. A few years ago, I had reached the weight of 200 pounds and I'm five, nine. And I wasn't as upset over being 200 as I was upset over the number. And it wasn't me. That is not my number, damn it. And so uh, I didn't go on a diet, but I made some adjustments to my my food intake. Um, In 2020, July, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, to which my doctor said, well, Richard, you know, it's going to be a long road back. And I said, no, it is not. And the reason is because I know how I got here. When the pandemic hit, what did everybody go to as far as foods? Comfort foods. What's in comfort foods? Sugars and carbs. Yep. Yep. Um, I was a big soda drinker as a kid. Now I bicycled everywhere, so I burned it off. So there was no issue. But I stopped bicycling when I got my driver's license at the age of 38. So I haven't had a soda since July 23rd, 2020. I had normal blood sugar a month and a half after the diagnosis. I was diagnosed on the 24th of July, 2020. I was back to normal in September. Uh, He gave me metformin, which I took the two tablets he prescribed once a day for about a week and a half as I was watching my blood sugar go down on the little meter that I also had. I said, I'm going to go back to one and I'm going to see what happens. I'll keep checking my blood sugar every day, 
see what happened. And it kept going down. So I said, I'm staying on the one. Went to see him in November of that year. Blood sugar was normal. He was shocked. Good for you. He said, okay, you can cut it back to one. Didn't tell him that I'd already done that. <laughs> so I eliminated the one. In February of 21, I saw him again. Again, another normal A1C. And he said, oh, you can stop taking them. I have four large medicine bottles of metformin at home. Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> I had my gallbladder taken out that in 2021. I uh, didn't know what it was. Felt like indigestion. But getting to this point, specifically the weight. As soon as I got down, and by the way, I was weighed the day I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. I was 182. Wow. When I went in for my gallbladder surgery, I was 174. Now, I think I'm back up in the 180s. But what I noticed when I went below 190, and my wife will attest to this, I was no longer, quote unquote, snoring or not breathing. <clears throat> and one of the things that I, I, I'd like for you to talk about as we continue here is when you gain weight, you don't just gain weight on the outside. You gain it on the inside. Ergo, <clears throat> if you gain weight on the inside, that means that the air passage is also gotten smaller because there's more tissue there, fat or whatever. And Absolutely. It's going to cause this problem. So doctors, Emily and Mitchell, uh, Kleonsky, we are talking with you here on Tell Me Your Story, and we're going to continue here. I'm Richard Dugan, your host with them, and tell me about this in terms of, um, the. Uh, do I want to call it the physiology that will help one to breathe, i.e. by losing the weight, uh, that will then help the brain to maybe prevent us going into the phase of dementia? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yes, I mean, it, it's funny, though, but it's a reciprocal relationship because what Emily was referring to earlier was that the oxygen also has a lot to do with the relationship between two hormones called leptin and ghrelin that exist there. I know it sounds like we're talking about Hansel and Gretel, but leptin and ghrelin, their balance determines when your body begins to burn sugar or burn fat and helps to regulate your weight. So if you're getting a proper balance of oxygen, leptin and ghrelin are in the proper balance. It's easier to lose weight. If you are getting more oxygen, you also feel more like exercising, which helps you lose weight. All those things then contribute to your breathing better. So one of the points that we make in the book is how there are all these different components that impact your dementia risk but there's also the interactions of all the components, which makes it much more complex. But it also means if you impact your physiology in one place, like reducing your hemoglobin A1C by typically increasing exercise and reducing your reliance on certain foods, in the process of that, you're also going to be able to now exercise more. You're more likely going to do other things. So these are all interrelated and you start someplace. Mm -hmm. For you, it sounds like you started at a really good place. You got a little scared because your doctor said, you got diabetes and you said, I don't want to do that. So that was motivating. For other people, it's because they, you know, they're waking their partner up with their snoring. For somebody else, it's because they're falling off of a bar stool because they realize they've really incrementally started drinking more. But hopefully it doesn't take a scare for everyone in yeah. order for them to say, you know, I want to save my brain. I don't I want to, as we say in the book, I want to stop being a dementia warrior. I want to start being a prevention warrior. I want to do something. I like that. I like that. I want to ask you a question from a, a physiological perspective, Emily. Dr. Emily uh, Kleonsky here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. And uh, I want to ask you, Dr. Uh, uh, Emily uh, uh, Kleonsky, uh, uh, this question that Mitchell actually brought up. How impactful, if that's the right word, is alcohol? on 
the the brain because when i was a kid growing up they used to say that you know alcohol destroys brain cells but Lately, I have heard that was a false statement that alcohol might destroy brain cells, but that we generate cells all over the body every second, a minute, hour of every day of every year. And we have a brand new body every seven years. So that means that the brain is also brand new every seven years. But it's what I wish that was true, Richard, but it's not. (laughs) Okay. 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 It is not. So let's let's unpack that one. OK, Please. so the 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 battle about how much alcohol is safe alcohol is still ongoing. Okay. And we went through this whole period where, you know, no alcohol was better than any alcohol. And then we went through a period where if you limit, if you were a man and you had two uh, normal size uh, drinks a day, you were okay. And if you were a woman, one drink a day was okay. And then they went back to the other extreme and said, no, 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 that's not good. What, what really the science seems to indicate and the most recent studies is that people who don't drink at all have a slightly higher risk of uh, dementia than people who drink very little to moderately, but people who drink moderately to more than moderately have a much higher risk. Mm. But now that we've addressed that, let's unpack this. you got a new brain every seven years. It is true that one small part of the human brain is capable of generating new, brand new baby brain cells until we drop over dead. The problem is we lose them at a far faster rate than we can create new ones. So unlike the rest of the body, no. What God gave us when we were born and we lost, believe it or not, most of them the day we were born. We are born with a great huge number of brain cells. We lose them that day. Then we lose another big bundle when we're teenagers and we start to prune, literally like pruning a tree, we prune the parts of the brain that haven't been used up until that point. As we go on from there, where we are basically until about the age of 30, stable in our brain cell number, unless you've had a traumatic brain injury, a stroke, you've had epilepsy, or you've had a a disease process. But then when we hit 50, this really nasty thing starts to happen. It's called age-related cognitive decline. Uh And we start to, this is universal. It's all mammals, by the way, not just human beings. We actually start to lose some of our brain functionality so that by the time that we're 50, we take slightly longer to do things than what we used to be able to do when we were 30. By the time we get into our 70s, we take double the amount of time to do certain brain operations Mm. than what we used to do. Mitch is a specialist in telling you like what the rate of decline is Mm -hmm. over uh, periods of time, but we will lose brain cells faster than we can ever replace them, which is why they're so precious to, to safeguard to begin with. So does that mean that the brain is actually, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm 62 already. Does that mean that my brain is actually uh, shrinking? Yes. Okay. So I've got more room in there. I put a zipper in and I keep pointing. (laughs) Hey, uh, I've got some other questions for you, but I want to let our (laughs) listeners know. Sorry about that. That's a lot, isn't it, Richard? Don't I, shake your head too hard. I, I just couldn't resist. It's uh, it's one of my um, one of my uh, characteristics. <laughs> Dementia prevention is the title of the book. We encourage you to pick up a copy. You can through uh, John Hopkins University Press. It's available in April of 2023, and it's using your head to save your brain. And there is a website that will be available shortly. We hope that by the time uh, you are hearing this program, this podcast or video cast, it is available. And it is brain doc b-r-a-i-n-d-o-c dot com 
I believe that's correct. And uh, we will uh, link to that so that folks can find out more about the work that you folks are doing as well, uh, because this is uh, extremely important in dementia prevention. Uh, our guests, they take you on a guided tour uh, through uh, dementia types. They teach you the history of these neurological, this neurological disease, or actually it is these, uh, the and discuss the more than 15 different factors known to affect your risk. Um, you know, uh, you, you mentioned earlier about energy level and so forth. Uh, I have to tell you that um, I have more energy these days. I have to, of course, remind that energy that the body is not 17 anymore and that you must find new ways of accomplishing old tasks so as not to uh, injure, bruise, or uh, stress yourself to where uh, for the next week and a half to two weeks, you have to wear a brace on the elbow or the knee or <laughs> take it easy, which frustrates me even more. Uh, but uh, I want to say, I can't say this with certainty because nobody really knows uh, that I stand a good chance of not because I, I don't have a formal education. I have no PhD. I have no MD or anything of this nature, but I am constantly learning from these programs. By the way, this is my therapy. I want you to know you two have now become one of my thousand therapists and I appreciate you. your stepping in uh, to do that. Um, but I also know people who are, and you've just described it, uh, uh, Emily, um, y who are, uh, they're, they're not moderate drinkers. They're heavy drinkers. They also have very low self-esteem. They also have a head injury. And they're supposed to go see, from what I understand, they're supposed to go see a neuropsychiatrist to diagnose the injury that they sustained to see if there might be some impact there. And what I've also found is that they seem to ask the same questions uh, a multiple of times, even they know who I am, they know where they are and so forth, but they will ask the same question. And I have taken the position as I did with my wife's aunt many years ago, she was in hospice and I walked in with my wife and the, uh, her aunt looked at me and said, Oh, doctor, uh, what are you doing here? And I says, I'm here to see you because I was told you don't challenge them. You don't say, oh, no, 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 auntie. It's Richard. You don't do that. You go with them because if you don't, you start to create drama that they don't need and you don't need. And uh, she says, well, but don't you have other patients to see? I said, no, you're my only patient. I'm just here to see how you're doing. And it was a wonderful experience. So when this person asks me these questions over and over again, I don't get mad. You just asked me that. Will you stop it? I just answer the question as if this person had asked me it for the very first time. Because again, it doesn't do any good. Do you find that a family and friends and so forth of people who are, is the right word, suffering through this dis-ease, this, this challenge, uh, they can tend to make it worse because they're unwilling to accept that this person right now does not know who you are and you need to go along with them. Don't make them come along with you. And that creates more struggle. And I'm, I'm addressing that to you, uh, uh, Dr. Emily. I would say that it's always best to try and minimize the stress and the drama in any situation. And it's certainly the way you described what you did with your aunt there, your wife's aunt was gracious and kind. And you had that ability in the moment to do that. What the real problem is, is that it's not just a matter in some families or in some caregiving situations that they don't understand that the person doesn't have the capacity to remember things anymore. They just get worn down. The stress of caregiving is huge, as you're probably aware. And so when people come to see us and we feel like we're treating the family, not just the individual who's yeah. got the disease, mm -hmm. it's really important to 
try and figure out how to support that family or that caregiver so they can, you know, sometimes we'll refer them to therapy so that they can let off the steam or they can learn maybe a new way to answer those questions. So it's not so hard on them to answer them sweetly or graciously or softly or gently. Um, so it's a tough situation, no matter which way you look at it, but you really bring up the great point of caregiver burden and the stress that that represents and how that in itself can be a barrier to maintaining your relationship with your loved one who has an illness. And that, that's true whether the illness is dementia, or whether the illness is cancer, or whether the illness is something else. Before we take a break here, um, a pause as it were. Mitchell, I want to ask you, if I may, um, uh, and, and both of you, uh, I'm going to ask both of you the same question here. Uh, like I said, I'm 62. My father is 92. My mother is uh, 89. They'll be celebrating their 66th wedding anniversary in June. Um, my mother has told me uh, about my father's difficulties as, as far as primarily his mobility. He's fallen a few times, has some abrasions, blah, 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 blah. However, she says in another text, he has the blood pressure of a 20 year old. Uh, he is healthy otherwise. Right. And after the passing of my, my sister, uh, in addition to the comment he made about how parents aren't supposed to bury their children. And so I had no response to that. I, that there is no response. Right. Uh, he had also had a conversation with my mother uh, and now taking this issue of the health uh, condition in, into, uh, uh, into account. He says, I'm just tired. I, I'm just, um, I'm, I'm worn out. Um, this, I'm that. Da, 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 da. I just, I just want to go to which my mother in her inimitable way, God love this woman. She says, Okay, so what are you going to die in? Okay. Love it. <laughs> now, I would venture that the two of you, because of your education, as you mentioned, one of the factors that can help, that the two of you are probably less predisposed to dementia or the, the various forms of dementia. But let's just say that it's, in your cards down the road, maybe five or 10 years. Do you ever think about that with, for yourself or for the other that, Oh my God, I may have to take care of him or her. Oh, absolutely. Does that, does that scare you or do you have a different, maybe intellectual, maybe not so much emotional uh, perspective on it? Well, I, I'm as a patient, Richard, and that's now what we're talking about, me in the role of the patient as opposed to me in the role of the doctor. Right. I've done just about everything I possibly can do that I've learned about in the process of taking care of my patients and writing this book and looking at all the research. I've done, I've taken all the steps that can be taken to prevent dementia. There's stuff that I did when I was younger that I can't go back and change. I can't use an eraser on those three concussions I've had in my brain. Can't make that go away. Right. Um, and my mother died at 92. So I've got some good genes coming in from that side and nobody in the family had dementia. Um, but I certainly, it worries me. So it's one of the reasons why um, in the pandemic, just before the pandemic started, I decided that at my five foot four, weighing a hundred and, you know, almost 60 pounds at that point, I decided that no, 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 this is not going to be good for my brain for the rest of my life. So I started to get on my bike, my stationary bike, three times a day for 10 minutes a day, which is what we advocate our patients doing. So I decided to treat myself like my own patient. Mm -hmm. I made myself do that exercise to the point where I'm now up to two hours a day on my stationary bike. I'm back down to a size four. I weigh 130 pounds, which is the way God designed me, my body to be. Um, and I would, I will do everything I can, including getting hearing aids, because this is one of the things that we know will prevent um, getting demented. Mm -hmm. I make sure I've got my glasses and my eyes checked regularly, and I'm treating my glaucoma to preserve my vision. You and I share that. My blood pressure is really well controlled. Uh, I do not drink more than my little one glass of wine a day. 
I stopped smoking back in 1987, thank heavens. So I've done all the things in the book that I can, that we know of today that can prevent my getting dementia because I consider it my responsibility to my spouse to take good care of me and I take good care of him. So I, I look at his homocysteine levels. I look at his methylmalonic acid levels. We check the vitamin D levels. We check the iron and total iron binding capacity. We do all the good caretaking stuff that needs to be done. But yeah, does dementia scare me? Absolutely. Just like cancer scares the living bejeebies out of me. By the I way, mean, Mitchell, if you I like mean, the work she's doing, bring your car in. She'll do that too. Hey, Mitchell, <laughs> what about you? I mean, what about you? I wasn't scared. I'm sorry? Yeah. I'd be a fool if I wasn't scared about some things in this world. Sure. It helps to What's be you, scared. Mitchell? The, I actually have a different take on this, which is not uncommon for us, by the way. You may have gathered that already. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's what keeps it saucy. Uh, I have actually a greater risk than she does genetically. My mother yeah. developed dementia. I spent my 50th birthday with her in a psychiatric hospital after she believed that people were up in the trees talking to her as an early onset of her dementia in her 70s and was involved in her care in many ways over the next 13 years of her life. So I've seen that face. I've seen the change. I've sat there and talked to somebody for two years who could not talk back to me, who could no longer walk and needed to be moved by a wheelchair. I've been there and done that. And part of what that has given me is at least an insight into what it's like to be on the other side, to sit on my patient's chairs, because I've been that person with the family. Rather than being frightened, I am really motivated. So I use my CPAP every night. I've been on it for 17 years. Mm. I believe and Emily may disagree, that I think better now than I did 17 years ago. No, you do. I walk approximately 10,000 steps a day. I reduced my weight by 20 pounds as well. There's a number of things that I believe are important to do because it's my job to take care of myself, so I'm never in that position. Someday, hopefully, I'll die in my sleep. And I'll maybe be 95 when I do it. That's 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 the forecast. Yeah. So getting there, you know, it's, uh, I, I think that it's really important for all of us to seize this moment rather than be scared of it, rather than back off of it, rather than think it's inevitable. I think it's important for us to seize the moment. I've seen it in what we do with the people come to see us. That's what the whole mission of this is about. We want all the people out there to be out of those ones out of twos, if it's possible, for them to be the ones, yeah. not the twos. Well, I, I have to say it reminds me of that public service announcement uh, where the, the woman, uh, she is uh, standing there in front of the camera and she's talking about type 2 diabetes and it's done in black and white and she's giving you the scare announcement. And then they do take two and then it's in color and then she gives you that's that message you just gave us, Mitchell, that you have an opportunity to live a life and you can do these things and it can be a great time. And I have to say that when I was going through, uh, when I was uh, diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, now I had been on the periphery. I'd been diagnosed as being on the periphery of diabetes a couple of times in the last uh, 17 years since we moved to Santa Barbara. Uh, and then, of course, I was also normal. I had normal blood sugar. But when he told me this, I would say it took me about 30 minutes to kind of work my way through, process it in my brain. And it was then that I realized, oh, I know how I got here. OK, uh, I and, and I, it's nobody. This is not the food industry's fault. This is on me. It's my responsibility. And I took the bull by the horns. Uh, and number one, eliminated 100%, haven't had a soda since the 23rd of July, 2020. 
Now I drink those flavored sparkling waters. Some will say, oh, but Richard, they're in plastic bottles. Look, one step at a time. Okay. <laughs> yes. down, all right. Let's just deal with that right now. Uh, I want to get off the high blood pressure meds. Uh, and, and I think that I have a, a, a good handle on it, but I am not going to toss the meds out just because I, oh, I'm feeling great, you know, cause I mean, my A1C, are you ready for this? A1C when I was diagnosed was 11.2. Oh my heart. And when they tested my blood sugar that day, it was 544. Yeah. Richard. They could have tapped you and uh, fl flavored some sugary substance with you. That you is there's some powder. That came, white powder that came out. Yeah. White powder came out. And, uh, but wow. since then I've had a few highs of maybe 138, 148, uh, and so forth. But the thing is, is that like blood pressure that I also learned about, it goes up and down depending upon when you ate last and this and that and the other thing. So, uh, and then of course I even asked in regards to blood pressure, I says, well, how do you know, doc, that my individual unique blood pressure doesn't run a little higher than most. I know what the norm is 120 over 80. I can't remember the last time I had 120 over 80. Maybe it was 123, 125 over, blah, blah, blah. And, and then, I mean, of course, my doctor didn't have any answer to that question. Uh, but again, we're all individuals. And I know what the, the, I know how they create the statistics. You talk about your evidence-based scientists or doctors, evidence-based. Well, but the way they skew the evidence sometimes, especially when it comes to, st to statistics, not easy for you to say. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's like, okay, the average height is whatever it is. And, um, uh, I mean, let me, uh, do that. Five, ten for men, five, six for women. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, and then, yeah, then you break it down into men and women. Then you break it down into age groups and the list goes on of breaking it down. When my wife was diagnosed with a, a, a rare form of fallopian tube cancer back in 2001, and you said, uh, you know, uh, you know, not designed to be a caregiver. I didn't know what the heck that was. And I sure as hell didn't sign on for that. But I I stuck it out. Anyway, um, we found out that her rare form of, of fallopian tube cancer had a even after chemo had a 70 percent, um, only a 30 percent survival rate. All right. So I said, well, I want to see the studies. I want to see the statistics of those 70%. What were they eating? What were they drinking? What was their lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. And of the 30, then I found a good friend of mine. His mother had the same thing. I says, oh yeah. When was she diagnosed? Oh, it was 10 years ago. And she's doing fine. My wife, after 22 years, she's doing fabulous. So, and been free and clear of it ever since. This is the thing about medicine that is so frustrating for so many people, folks, uh, is that you have the stats, you have the averages, you have all of those things. But again, it goes back to we're all individuals. We're all individuals. And that's really what we're talking about. So what I uh, am going to do here is let you know, folks, you're listening to Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. And uh, Emily and Mitchell, I want to thank you so much for uh, for being here on the program. I have three final questions that I want to ask you. Uh, and uh, I'm going to do that very quickly here because I know we're all pressed for time. And that is number one, and I'm going to bounce this back and forth. We we do this every, uh, uh, every, uh, every uh, year, uh, every year, every program throughout the 15 years we've been doing this program. And the first of those questions to you, Emily, is who is Emily Kleonsky? Emily Kleonsky is a dynamic, vivacious, uh, often um, unorthodox, 71-year-old mouthy woman who cares <laughs> tremendously about this world and the people in it. Mitchell, who is Mitchell Kleonsky? I'm Emily Kleonsky's husband. <laughs> All right. So Don't now, be anything more than that. <laughs> All right. Well. Mitchell, you get the next question. <laughs> Emily gets to think about it. Mitchell, what is your life's purpose? My life's purpose, I believe, is to help other people achieve their life's purposes. Hmm. And Emily, what is your life's purpose? 
I'm actually doing it right now. Um, I, I firmly believe that as a result of a car accident that I suffered a concussion in and a week later decided to become a doctor and take care of poor people. And I literally did do that, gave up everything else. And then eventually became a national public health doctor and became a doctor who would take care of people and see them in their homes and got committed to, to preventing dementia and taking care of the demented and the dying. That's, that's my purpose in life is to serve and to, to just care passionately about it until the day I drop dead. Our final question. I hope you get the movie reference. Emily. What was your best day? The day I graduated from medical school. And Mitchell, what was your best day? What I'm living today. Well, uh, Emily and, and Mitchell, I want to thank you two doctors for joining us here on the program and uh, helping us to better understand. There's certainly a lot more we could talk about. You take us through steps in the book uh, on ways to prevent. You've mentioned some of them here on the program. So we hope people will go to your website once it's available to the folks, braindoc.com. Uh, it's really been a pleasure. And um, I won't forget this interview as long as I live. And it hopefully will be till 100. Absolutely, Richard. Thank you for the strong work you do. Keep it Invite up. us back anytime you like. I absolutely will. I definitely would love to have you back. I'm Richard Dugan, and I thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. We are giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And until our next broadcast, podcast, video cast, love to lol and L Jeanette, I almost forgot your name. I'm listening. <laughs>